uh, a SaaS platform to bring together multiple uh, collaboration platforms in the industry like BIM 360 and Procore and SharePoint and Microsoft Teams and uh, uh, create a secure framework to, uh, to operate projects and, and foster collab collaboration and communication. So uh, what I'd like to do is take a quick, quick recap of, of last month um, so that way we, and, and really this is more just over the last couple of conversations, is to look at Digital Twin and, and how that works across all of the different uh, phases of the projects uh, that we all work in and, and, and what ties all that together. And in a previous uh, conversation was this concept of digital, uh, of, of, a, of a golden thread uh, that Anil described for us, where we have uh, data that you essentially separate from the model that is that follows through the entire process. So from beginning to end, uh, we can capture that information. We can see a change and and look at digital twin as a uh, as a container, if you will, uh, and and that that container that follows along on the thread uh, to to drive that uh, that need for that information through the digital twins. Uh, what we'd like to talk about uh, in this conversation is to move away from some of the bigger picture, right? We've been talking about, uh, you know, the design side, the owner's side, what has to happen to make all this work. And I think it's important to think about uh, both the strategic and the tactical uh, as we start to put the pieces together. And, and by taking a, a view of, of a piece of the puzzle and understanding how other industries have, have brought this information together uh, so that we can create standards, so that we can have a piece of data that flows through the system, uh, that's why we're focusing on, uh, uh, on this tactical level uh, discussion today. So what I'd like to do is ask uh, Ralph and John to talk a bit about uh, not new standards, but MAP standards and how you guys are bringing information together within the context of uh, ISO 19650. Over to you guys. Okay. Well, I might start off. Um, we, we sort of, or I have a sort of a simplistic view of the digital twin that it's this digital representation of a physical building or piece of infrastructure that's represented by three types of data, the graphical data, the non-graphical data, and the documents and where we're at at the moment uh, in what people call level two BIM is we're exchanging that information through files or containers. And the ISO 19650 standard is a standard to organize and digitize that information. And the, the, the standard talks about the containers and obviously has a quite a broad definition of containers you know, they could be folders, they could be files, they could be objects within a model. But uh, I suppose we're, where we're at at the moment in industry, particularly in, in Ireland and Europe, is people are exchanging files. And, uh, and that the, the ISO standard says that those files should have some metadata codes that explain to people what's in the file without having to open the file to, to have a look at the file. Now, the, the, the ISO standard doesn't specify what those codes are other than status, revision, and classification. Um, so the UK have taken that a little bit further and they've developed a national annex to the ISO 9, 19650 and they, they've gone and defined eight different codes that uh, they feel obviously describes you know, what, what, is, was it, what is in the container. And the reason I've got a, a picture of a a license plate there because that's you know, kind of a simplistic way of thinking about the file naming conventions. It's, it's about giving uh, each file that's within your, your system a, a license plate, if you like, that describes uh, what's, what's in the file. So if, you've, if you're not from Ireland, then you won't know what that, that license plate means. Uh, but if you are from Ireland, then you'll know that the IRL on the beginning, on the left-hand side, tells you that this vehicle's in Ireland that the zero zero tells you that it was registered in the year 2000, that the D tells you that it was registered in County Dublin, and the number tells you the registration of that vehicle. So um, the usefulness of that registration plate as a car or vehicle drives past you is understanding what the codes mean. So not just having a code, but also understanding what the code means. So giving the code meaning. So if, 
if I take uh, what you see on that image, the first code that is defined in the, the um, UK annex to ISO 19650, which is the project code, uh, which is a four to six character code that's defined for a project, the code itself doesn't actually tell you anything. So you have to, you have to expand that a bit out, out a bit further and give that code some meaning by defining the project name, its description, the type of work it is, et cetera, the project location, and um, you know maybe the current stage that this project is at. So the reason John and I worked on this mind map was because we were talking about exchanging files between different common data environments and sharing these this information. And you know it just seemed that every common data environment platform had its own set of codes and you know we just thought well is is there a way we can try and get some agreement of you know what's really important to know about a file so we just as a first attempt put down this this ma this map of parameters uh, that flow from the eight codes that are defined in the U uk annex and um and then we opened it up i suppose to to various people to to begin to discuss these. Uh, at the moment, there's about 100, and, uh, I think it's 140 maybe um, parameters of information. Um, some people might think that's too much information. Other people might think it's not enough information. But the the purpose was really just to to get some discussion going. I appreciate and, uh, that uh, yeah. that insight. So, uh, yeah. I don't know if you want to take it from there, John. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. What I was going to add was the other side of the argument that so Ralph and I had, you know, a big, uh, I suppose, discussion over this mind map. And Ralph was a big advocate of the file naming convention. It's something that's been developed in the UK for the last 15 years, right from the BS 1192, and it's carried over straight into the ISO 19650. I don't think it's particularly useful because as a software developer who actually moves information containers between different software vendor platforms, an eight digit code is only a subset of all of the metadata that could potentially describe the contents of this car in this, uh, in this metaphor to do, with the, to do with the number plate. So I suppose what we were, what, yeah, what, what we were trying to do here was think in terms of what are the standard set of metadata that we would apply to any given information container as it's exchanged between the systems. And we were starting to try and think of which would be general and what we, I suppose the contents of this mind map is kind of general um, metadata, but really what, what I was interested in was getting down to the next level and actually and describing, you know, for every document, they may have this metadata, but documents that have a type fire safety or incident report would have a different set of metadata attributes. And what we were trying to do was essentially, and I suppose what the point of this, uh, this uh, roundtable discussion is, for me is, and, and for everyone else, I believe, is that uh, we'd like to discuss, you know, the merit of each of these metadata properties and I suppose the purpose of the information container as this abstract piece of or you pretty much data container that's shared between multiple distributed systems that are, are not connected and then none of them share the same interfaces so for example you might have a document type contract in one system they might be described with five metadata fields um, and then in another system, they might describe them with 25. So you kind of have this problem that one information container that comes out of one source system doesn't easily, um, uh, can't easily enter another another system. So, yeah. There's, so, there's... so John, as a data person, mm -hmm. one of the key things that I'm wondering, just I'm so I'm just riffing on your comment a little bit, is the strength of the alternate key is can we define uniqueness of an alternate key? And if we can do that based on external reality factors, like a lot of the pieces that Ralph was pointing out, could we come to something that we could agree was was physically unique 
and therefore we could agree could be represented uniquely in the data structure. Well, Ralph and I did um, kind of look at this, right, Ralph? So, um, like, uh, I assume alternate key is another word for a foreign key, let's say. So, you know, it's or a point for a piece of information. So in the ISO 19650 standard as well, you actually have the, you have, I, I'd mind that you take over here, Ralph, when you're about to describe the IOR and the content of that and how that binds in with kind of the preparation for the project and what information containers are being, you know, the metadata and types of information containers that can be shared on a project. Yeah, well, I think it's important to remember that the ISO standard is written to accommodate all eventualities. So whether you're doing a small house extension or a major hospital, you know, so it, it's, it's quite vague in, in its description uh, and it allows the project team to define things at a project level that is suitable to the scale and complexity of the project. You know, so I think that's important to remember. And, and that's why when you go into, when you read through the main body of the ISO standard, it's less prescriptive, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of giving the flexibility to the project team. Uh, but of course, let's say you're the UK government, um, you know, you, you don't want every project team to go and make up a new way of doing things. So, uh, so they've taken that further and they've defined a national standard um, for, you know, for all UK government works that, that they want people to follow. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, and that's why you've ended up with these sort of predefined codes, if you like. But even the, the code itself, it still has to be defined at the project level, except for some predefined codes that they've set up in the, in the national annex. So, so I think it would be really so easy to flexibility get flexibility there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be really easy to get down in the weeds on, on data stuff. And it's always, that's where the, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Is getting down to that level of detail, but it's, it's hard to, to follow through without some frame of reference. So Jan, perhaps you can talk a little bit about orange button and how you've applied uh, things from other industries to the solar construction and, and put that into reference for folks. And I think that'll foster some of our discussion questions after that. Uh, so, so my question was was an authentic. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I realized I messed up the flow, but I was no worries. <laughs> um, authentically interested in this thinking about this digital qu twin and identifying assumptions that are made. We have made several assumptions in solar, for instance, where we are assuming that the location is always on the roof, which is of course not going to be valid for general construction. So mm -hmm. this is just an interesting topic altogether. Um, Orange Button was started by the Department of Energy, and and it was initiated by a group of people who had worked, um, Alfred Berkeley and stuff, who had started NASDAQ, and the SEC had asked NASDAQ to come up with a data standard so that everyone could report their financials in the same way, it could be compared, and they could make appropriate um, observations about fraudulent activity, but also appropriate valuations and all of that kind of activity. So it was very complex. It had a lot of um, emotional charge around all the financial issues. And so they were able to deal with several pieces of interoperability that have been very useful in applying that to solar. So they came in with the Sunshot Initiative and came up with, you know, as part of that, it's to try to apply the same things to solar technology. So I just wanted to share quickly um, some of the pieces that we've been working on with the orange button, button editor that shows the key elements that we have found are useful. Um, so here is, is a site as it is currently outlined in the orange button format. And within that you can have an object that is going to be an array of energy consumptions. And energy consumption has got an array of usages. So energy consumption is defined by this array of energy usage. And then energy AC is our core unit. And underneath this, we have found that the key things and what came out of XBRL are what we call these primitives. So in addition to the normal value that you would assign to a data, we're actually 
explicitly calling out the unit used this time. So it could be kilowatts, it could be megawatts, depending upon the size of the system going on. Um, and then start time is when you started measuring that energy, end time is when it was done. And then you would only ever have one or the other of precision versus decimals. So you would be two places are precise, or you would say that de decimals are correct to the hundredth place. You, those are mutually exclusive, but you can de describe it in both ways. And by sharing these common sets of primitives, the SEC has been able to define everything required for financial reporting about every publicly traded company in this common structure and then be able to compare and run analysis and detect frauds and all the kind of stuff that they do. And we have found that this has been a, a very useful way of bringing down the data is that each element, each concept would have these primitives so that we can define specifically what's, what's going on. Uh, we do restrict energy AC can only have units that are at least the energy item type. And so this is this was mainly the concept that I wanted to introduce because it it is what has enabled us to be flexible across a wide range of sizes of projects, everything from a residential house to a utility scale production. And and it has been very robustly utilized in other knowledge domains. So this was the element that I wanted to add to the conversation with the ISO standards as we talk about what it actually takes to make standards usable for um, in our actual lives, in our real work, working world. So appreciate I just wanted that. to offer that to the mix. I appreciate that. And, and what I'd like to do at this point is before we get into, say, a group discussion, it, we've seen a couple different perspectives here. One is coming from... Uh, the U UK primarily, and the other is coming from a, a U.S. perspective, but, you know, in a interrelated but different industry. Um, does anybody have any questions around how, how, how does that tie together or some thoughts about how do we take lessons learned from both to, to drive what we're trying to do here, uh, you know, to, to solve a small building block in this digital twin conversation? I had a couple of questions, Kelly. Sure. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think the idea of mapping of the standards is brilliant. If we could have a little bit more discussion on that, that would be useful. And just a question in terms of uh, data. What do you see the role of uh, data templates for construction objects, the ISO 23387 that's released in 2020? in terms of uh, mapping of the standards, uh, unique identifiers and other meta metadata discussion that we just had. Yeah, I'm not sure who the question was for, but uh, um, I suppose in, the, in what we're looking at at the moment is we're looking at the, the transfer of files or documents. So a product data template uh, in what we're looking at would be a file. The contents of the product data template, I think, is what, what you would be talking about there with the, the ISO 23387. Um, you know, that's a, so it's at a different level, I think, when, you, when you're exchanging a product data template between two systems, um, you know, we, that product data, data template would have a set of codes or parameters and, and uh, corresponding metadata descriptions, if you like. Uh, and then inside that product data template, there would be product data attributes and properties uh, that would would comply with the, the ISO standard you mentioned. But I suppose I, I had a question uh, maybe for this community, because when, when John and I looked at this property map, uh, we were just looking at it from a pra practitioner's point of view. And, um, you know, we I, we began, began to discuss whether you could just describe some of these properties using the IFC structures. So for instance, IFC has uh, you know, IFC project, IFC description, you know, and I was wondering if anybody else on the call had, had done any work, um, you know, can you describe a document using the IFC schema? If anybody had looked at that, that would be 
interesting to us. Well, I wanted to chime in here, Frank. I, the question really is, um, first of all, in terms of a, a digital twin, which is some digital representation of a physical asset. So they seem to see some consensus that there is kind of a digital requirement. And then by, def by association, I would agree that a, a common data environment, there's some prerequisite to realizing this dream of a digital twin. So some people say you have to have a BIM model. Some people say you don't really have to have a BIM model, but, but there's some digital representation uh, of the physical asset. That implies that there's gonna be some kind of, if you don't have your data house in order, you, so a common data environment in ISO 1950 is a great thing to leverage, but if you're talking about BIM models, then there also has to be an object metadata standard. So I think it's all interrelated. And it may be premature to talk about the, the, the exchange mechanism uh, ahead, ahead of some kind of a, a set of data standards. And so I think um, IFC is something we can leverage, but we don't have complete coverage and, and Jeffrey may disagree with me, but you know, for infrastructure, for example, and Ralph, you know this, the, the UK BIM level two uh, uh, that specified IFC as an enabling standard for infrastructure, even though we don't have a certified uh, IFC um, model view definition, right? <laughs> Our certifications available. So I think it might be premature to introduce the data exchange standard unless that's interrelated to a data schema around how you represent these digital assets in some kind of a standard way. Uh, I, uh, Mr. Steve Holzer, can I say something yeah. a little kind of overarching on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, from, from a digital twin perspective, um, and I got to selfishly, I would, it would be my dream if you were all on my call in an hour and a half with the Digital Twins Consortium Infrastructure Work Group. Um, and because uh, it's one of the differences with that body, I mean, we could use everybody there, you know, like, like bringing in the expertise on the 19650 uh, and and, and Jeffrey, well, now Building Smart International is actually just signed last week with Digital Twin Consortium. Autodesk is a founding member now. Uh, that was announced today. Actually, Dan would be here if, if, if he wasn't doing the Autodesk onboarding call. But there's a lot going on over there, um, be, and it's by owners. Uh, we, we've got, you know, the Microsofts of the world, not just from their data. But so a lot of these, I think, problems are going to be solved in the industry, not 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 silver bullet, not complete, not a new standard, nothing like that. How does this all work together? To Frank, what you were talking about, and a lot of the discussions we've had, and it'll be published in the next month, is that bumper sticker definition of what is a digital twin. And, and with, with the likes of, of, of Lendlease, Microsoft, GE, Siemens, and, and there's four verticals in there. It's infrastructure, which is roads. I mean, uh, New South Wales, their whole transportation department's part of this. But, but not just vertical uh, infrastructure of buildings, horizontal, and then another whole aerospace and defense, and then another whole segment of, of natural resources and mining. Uh, and, and they're all coming to, with common definitions. Uh, and there's some other work groups run across all those, if you will, silos. Now, I, I say that as a little bit overarching. And one of the discussions we had is about where does BIM fit in? And it is just a piece of it. And maybe more what this particular group is focused on, and that's, that's great. But one of the outcomes that we've had in a lot of our long running discussions with a lot of these large owners, serial owners, the, the Microsofts that have billions and billions of dollars of real estate they're managing all over the world, lend lease, is um, you know, that, that operational data, that data flow into their even optimization of, of a facility in a given hour uh, after it's 15 years old. And, and how do we use the digital twin to accomplish those things? So I, I, I think it's important that we begin with the end in mind and that as realize that what's coming out of the design phase, which I happen to chair in the infrastructure group and goes into to the deliveries phase, um, which is kind of the construction, what we know as construction, and then ultimately becomes operational phase, it, it, it's got to, it's uh, got to become interoperable. Is it a common data environment? I don't know. I mean, none of this is all, you know, it, but it's it's working together uh, in in concert with these different pieces. I would love for everybody to be there, really. But uh, I just share that because I think we do need to keep that in mind as what we're doing in in these hard phases, the the design and delivery. How does that work for the owner? Jan, I think you had something to add to that. I I did, and it's it's a, a similar kind of question about how do, how do we get value out of this while we're thinking, like if we spend too much, it's a chicken egg, right? How much do you spend on the taxonomy and the definition versus you, actually when you deliver value to make this useful? And 
one of the things that we have found in the solar industry is that we actually talk about the data itself as candy and the taxonomy around it is the wrapper. And every, people are only willing to figure out how the wrapper works if there's some candy in the middle that they're gonna get. And so part of that has, and I saw that Mike Niemer is um, with the AHJs, but we're putting together an AHJ registry that is available for solar installers, but it's actually just publicly available open source for anybody that's got in US-based um, uh, counties. And it's got a unique identifier that is deciding this is the unique identifier for this AHJ that we're going to use commonly amongst our permitting or solar permitting in particular um, applications, but it'd be great if we expanded our view. And we're including that data. So you can send in a, a given house, an owner can send in the house that they're doing a project on and get back which AHJ is the permitting authority that they need to work with, what those standards are in that AHJ. And so they immediately feel value and the fact that they're using an orange button compliant API and terms to get there is something they don't even know about. But it, but they're because they're getting the candy, we're getting a lot of adoption really quickly. And since June, it's just been been really amazing and great and intense and fast. But the key to making that happen is that we had to actually include the candy not just the wrapper, because nobody wanted to talk about the wrapper by itself. But when we put them together and had a deliverable, then it mattered. And we literally just decided it's a universally unique identifier. We've got what version that does have like a license plate code that's got like an AHJ code that has some meaning to it. But we have a programmatic just decided this is what the standard's going to be for the solar industry. And it's unique enough that that we can move forward to get it. So we're hoping, I mean, you know, perhaps that's over, overstepping, but because it's delivering value, it's getting the adoption that we needed to give it the momentum to move forward. So I, I do think that if we can find ways to include candy with the wrappers, that we'll get much more interest from the industry as a whole in adoption. Okay. I think that's a great point. And, and let me dovetail it back to our, our conversation last time, because really in the last two conversations, we've said digital twin really moves forward when owners get behind it and pay for it and want it and drive it. So what's the candy in the wrapper? I open that up to the floor. What's, what's the candy? What makes owners say, okay, I'm willing to play the game or join some association to, to kind of define these things. Anybody? If I can like chime in. Hi, so uh, Mohammed here from Marta. We're a startup based out of London. I think the, like just going back very quickly to like 19650, it all starts with why, why are you doing this? So you're meant to be considering why you require the information and why you require the information. It's to potentially improve and deliver on project outcomes, to deliver a project on time, to deliver project within budget, or to um, optimize the operation, the, the life cycle costs of an asset. And when you're starting to see it from that perspective, the data becomes something that I need in order to potentially be able to drive better decisions and, and then succeed in delivering the specific outcomes that I'm trying to achieve. So, and, and in many ways, I would say like that is often missed in the standard um, because it's meant to start with what am I trying to achieve as an organization, like in, in or, or the suite of standards? What am I trying to achieve and why? What is the purpose of this information? Now that I have this purpose for information, how am I, how, which, which, what is it that I'm going to need? And then how is it going to be delivered? So the data requirement comes way down the line. It's not the first thing that um, comes up in any way. And I think that's like, quite important to remember when taking um, these discussions. With regards to the comments that are being made about um, digital twins and whether BIM is an enabler for that, I guess it like completely depends on 
how you look at information management. Um, at the end of the day, a source of information could be an IoT device just as much as it can be a Revit model, just as much as it can be an ERP um, solution. But ultimately, they're all sources of information with different frequencies with which they're exchanged. What 19650 gives people is a process with which the, the methodology almost like should be defined and information exchanges should be defined. But the, the sources can be variable and, and the implementation right now is focused on Revit and BIM in its most conventional sense. But really it's a standard that can be used in, in much the same way to enable digital twins in the way that people are um, talking about and considering. But fundamentally going back to the why, the, the first clause of the standard and the first few bits are all focused on what is the candy really, as, as Jan is saying? What, what is it that I'm trying to achieve as a company? And I'm trying to deliver my multi-billion dollar project in the best way that I could and get out of it what I'm meant to be getting out of it. I appreciate I'll, that insight. Yeah, I would say, to... yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I actually think it's worse than you saying there, Mohammed. Like, the implementation at the moment on projects on the ground is people exchanging files. They're not, you know, so a Revit model might, might be one type of file they exchange, but they're exchanging lots of different files, drawing files, PDFs, you know, product brochures, you know, so, you know, so it's even more basic than I think you're describing at the moment. Uh, and. And I suppose what John and I have been discussing is you, you, the means of exchanging those files as defined in the standard now is the common data, a common data environment. Uh, but, but it's not one system, if you like, because the owners will have one system, the designers will choose to use one system during the design phase, the contractors will choose to use a different system during the construction phase. Uh, building operators or facilities managers might choose to use a different system. And now you have this dilemma where you're trying to exchange files between multiple systems, uh, or, or even worse, you're having to upload files three or four times into different systems. <laughs> yeah, and then each time you try and do that, everybody's used a different uh, file naming convention or, or coding system. Uh, and the co and the codes don't mean the same things as somebody mentioned you in one system there's five pieces of data and in another system there might be 20 pieces of data so that's where we're at at the moment right now that's the the candy as Jan, Jan would say would be to try and unpick all that and make it easier for people <laughs> uh, so one of the things that's come up is particularly that that we have found is that it's the reference data that if we have we, we, it's really hard to work within the data, but we, we have actually gotten some examples where we are working per project data, but the, it's the reference data is easier to get people excited about. So everybody having a common understanding of AHJs and codes, the very next thing that they want is common product data. They want product data and certifications, stuff that should be referenceable generally, but right now people literally every solar company has got somebody who goes in and downloads from all the different manufacturers what their spec sheets are for every single product so they can put it in the permit application. It is a colossal waste of time in my humble opinion, but it's if they had common reference data that they could just get it um, so that we're helping more people because we kind of need to share the burden of, of what the lift is to doing this. So reference data might be a place to look. Is there common reference data that if we were all had that, we would have something like a single source of truth that the designers and the architects and inspectors would all be I'm, referencing I'm, the same info? I'm mm -hmm. curious. Maybe, how, maybe I, the building smart data dictionary is that, I don't know. I, I'm curious how you get that without having product standards. You know, the, it's almost like, you know, you talk, we talk about common data environments, but you know, so I download the submittals for my products. The manufacturer is going to change those products. They may be interchangeable if I need to replace it. They may not be. They may be end of life. Uh, there's really no common place like an escrow 
location for the data. Uh, some of the, you know, the, the common data environments that we use as a subcontractor, we don't even get to choose those. Uh, they're chosen by the general contractor, they're chosen by the owner. So my, I can't get the candy because everyone else has the ingredients and they all have different ingredients. So from an enterprise perspective, I don't even have the data anymore. It's, it's sitting in all these other systems um, because they don't, they don't communicate together. But you know, we run into the same thing, product submittals. Uh, you know, I, I wanna know what was installed in that building but I also want to know what the manufacturer has. So I don't know that you can do this successfully without having the manufacturers at the table as well. And, and, and in the solar industry, we are, we, I guess we've got some advantages. One is that the California Energy Commission is pretty much setting the standard for the rest of the country. That's not entirely true, but it's substantially true. And so people are used to having a central common source of data, even though it's got all sorts of problems, but they're, but they've got, they're kind of used to looking in one place to get that product data. So that helps and the manufacturers are used to needing to submit it in that way so that it helps that we've got some, um, because the technology is changing so quickly, we do have some standards there that they're expecting a single source of authority. Um, I would wonder, like, does the UL listings or other kinds of standards agencies, are those available for how you could get that common product data with, with revisions? And the other thing that we come up with is what is a product? And if you've got a different configuration, is it a different product? Particularly if it's able to go on different, you know, the 110 versus the 220 power ratings in the U.S. versus the rest of the world. So things like that are are absolutely interesting questions. Do you guys have any place where you're used to looking for a single source of data that if you could convert the center, the networks would flow? I, th I think what, uh, what Darren was saying is it's all over the place. There, there is not, uh, and I see Travis shaking his head <laughs> and I saw Jeffrey raising his hand a second ago. So do you have something to add to that, Jeff? Well, all right. So from a building smart perspective and John, John Egan should know this too, because he's uh, working with the, the CDE people. So from the international perspective, this is recognized. It's been recognized for a long time. And there have been, you know, multiple efforts on multiple fronts for this. So, you know, one part of it is, yeah, you, it helps to have at least one, doesn't have to be the only one, but it helps to have at least one sort of reference semantic schema to make all this work. And the reason you want at least one is because then you can begin to use linked data methodologies to connect multiple standards and multiple data sources, multiple databases together. So we know that we know that today at Building Smart, and the things that we are working on are um, first of all the schema itself. So as Frank uh, uh, alluded to before, that's expanding to include more of infrastructure. We're trying to do a better job of covering, you know, buildings, but at the same time, recognizing that one schema will never cover everything for every UK use case for everybody involved. So instead you develop technologies like IFC OWL in which you're allowed to create, essentially use common linking abilities to link databases together through triple stores, through whatever mechanisms you want to do, and you know, and mine that data from different places and make sure that it matches up. Another part of that is the data dictionary, right? So BSI is kicking off a new version of their data dictionary, which essentially becomes a service. And it says that the only content that Building Smart really owns as a part of the service is the schema itself. But then what you do is you allow other content owners. Well, what are what is a content owner? Well, I'm a classification body, um, you know, a, a classification standards body. That's my content or my classifications. Um, I'm a product manufacturer and I have all this product data. That's a content owner. And what the data dictionary allows you to do is have that content show up to everybody who's willing to subscribe to that data dictionary. And when they go search for doors in their product, their product, like a, say a Revit, that Revit is connected to the data dictionary. And when they go to look for a door, they can establish what criteria they're looking for. And it can scour the, because of the data dictionary and if all the products are connected to it, it begin to get that feedback. 
But on top of that, you have to have things like product data templates, right? And that's the other thing that Neil pointed out to, which is being tackled at the ISO level. And the interesting part about the standard is it's not going to dictate what every bit and piece needs to be for every possible project, product, because the products are so different, is that instead it sets up a, a construct that says, if you're going to represent product data, this is how you would do it. And those product data templates then also become a part of the building smart data dictionary because they become linkable and mappable. So essentially what you do is you create this service that becomes a way of mapping all of these dis disparate data sources and then begin to provide an access point. And then what the data dictionary does, it provides an API and also a web interface if you want to just search that way. But the valuable part is it, prov it provides an API to end use products so that you, know, you can look things up. You can say, okay, well, I'm designing this project in Ireland and I know I have certain standards that I have to follow to for both classification and, you know, and for um, uh, 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 material standards and all these kinds of things. And by indicating that I am using those standards through this Building Smart Data Dictionary, I can begin then to fill out or find information that's directly related to any single entity in my building model. So then you start beginning to build upon that database. Now, even if I don't do it there, I might have another product that takes the model I got from the architect downstream and begins to fill out that data more, right? And by connecting to the same data service, I have access to that information. So I think, I think we have a better, I think we have a good understanding of how much potential information there is out there and how many disparate ways that it's done. But, but then again, you look at what, uh, what was described earlier, and that's why there's this concept of the open CDE group in Building Smart. And the open CDE group is trying to make those connections between common data environments by saying, listen, we have to have the ability for people to search from one common data environment to the other, that you can have data occur on one or the other and not in both places and possibly have conflict, but instead be able to go through an entire system and say, well, where can I find this and what does it look like? So I think that kind of addresses what Ralph was, was, was talking about is why should I upload something in three different places where it would be nice if I could search for my one place and find out where it is over there and maybe even look at it. I may not be able to retrieve it, I may not be able to edit it, but I might be able to at least look at it and know that it's somewhere else. So, so there's lots of these things that are being addressed and going on, just sort of letting people, you know, it's, it's not that these are unknown things, um, but I think, you know, as, as we've talked about before, I think it's recognizing what's happening and then searching out who's, you know, creating those solutions. I think what, what Jan brought up is very interesting. I'd like to look a little bit more at, at, at the, the orange button because I wonder how it could then leverage the idea of product data templates and the BSDB so that you could have a connection between a, a, another system and the orange button. So. Oh, well, I, I have actually taken that exact note and mm -hmm. we are literally defining that right now. I'm sure we're gonna have solar specific terminology, mm -hmm. but I, I'm gonna do my best to make sure that we can name the core yeah. the same things. So. Well, and, 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 and the important part then, and this is why we developed IFC, this is why IFC OWL was developed you know, a while back, was to say, I may have two dis disparate you know, repositories with these different nomenclatures, but I now have a way that I can map those together and link them and then be able to create a meaningful connection between those two disparate sources. If you're normalizing so. the schema, if you will. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to a certain degree. Yeah. To a certain degree. Okay, so we got about 30 seconds left. Uh, John Egan, what's your experience with bringing some of these systems together where what we've been talking about works or doesn't in 30 seconds? <laughs> and unmute yourself. 20 seconds. You he's talking away and he's unmute. Okay. He's All giving right. everybody the answer right now. <laughs> yeah. We'll uh, we'll circle back and we'll get that answer from him and, and and catalog that and share with everybody. Appreciate your attention. See you back in the main room. Um, with that, we'll jump into digital twin with Kelly Doyle, focusing on interoperability. Um, I briefly touched in, and I think this is a never-ending conversation that can layer on top of layer on top of layer. So, 
Uh, why don't you let us know where, where you guys ended up, Kelly? Sure thing. Uh, we, we've been talking things uh, at a high level for the past few, uh, few roundtables. Um, we decided to go tactical on this one. Um, and, and it didn't, uh, it didn't disappoint. <laughs> we got, we got pretty far down in the weeds. So I'll do my best to, uh, to bring up some of the high points, but, uh, if you have any interest in digital twin and, and how this interoperability is going to work, how are we going to get this data to start in the right container and flow through, uh, it was a great discussion. So, um, th the first thing we talked about was, uh, ISO 19650 and data mapping, um, there's really the way that we're sharing information now most often is, is through files. Um, and, and this standards helps to establish codes uh, that define the way uh, to talk about what's in that file without actually having to go into it to figure it out. It, it also helps with classification. Um, one of our subject matter experts shared the, uh, an Irish uh, auto registration plate. So think of a license plate for us uh, as a way to to uh, picture this. And the different codes mean when the car was registered, what county is it registered in, all these kinds of pieces of information are available on that tag. It tells you a whole lot. And that's really what uh, what the standard is trying to accomplish with, with these file names and what the metadata fields uh, tell us or uh, to be able to interpret that. Uh, we then talked about Orange Button, uh, which has grown out of a, uh, uh, a NASDAQ standard, actually, so that they could create interoperability between systems and help to identify fraud in a lot of these uh, disparate systems that they're, they're working with together. Um, what they've also done is taken that initial standard and applied it to that structure to the solar industry um, and, and actually started with building a database for uh, AHJs. So there's a way to, uh, to pull those pieces together to create a standard, a, a, a way that people can correlate these things together. Uh, and, and Jen, I've never heard this used before, but it was a great analogy uh, of the candy and the wrapper. The data is the candy and the standard is the wrapper. And for the most part, folks are not willing to talk about the wrapper without getting the candy. They need some incentive to be able to talk about it. So we really had a, a bit of a conversation about, the, about those incentives. How do we plant that candy out there so that folks are, are interested in talking to the wrapper and can bring context? Um, one of the things that came out of that discussion is that reference data will help. It's things that folks can get their mind around uh, and gets them excited about it. So product data is an example of this. Um, on every project, you, you have information about different building materials and systems and subsystems that are put into the built asset. Uh, having some way to bring that together um, and not have to send up 300 different cut sheets from different things that are out of date the minute you click send uh, would be great. Conversely, how do you bring that together when those cut sheets and those standards and, the, and that data is constantly changing is a huge challenge. Um, where we ended up was in a final discussion around the uh, Building Smart Data Dictionary. Um, this is where we can use common industry linking standards to bring together stakeholders to the information they need. Disparate systems, uh, it's, a, it's essentially a map of the disparate systems that allow folks by way of API to search for the information they need and populate the things that they need to do. You don't have to drive the model as the place to create the information. If you want to add it later, you have a place to go to to get it and then populate the model or populate some file that you're looking for. But but there's a common way to get there. There's a, there's a way to tie that information together. Uh, for me to go into any greater detail than that, we'll be here for the rest of the afternoon. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to jump on the video and, uh, and experience it firsthand. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, when we talk about taxonomies, often we find ourselves in a, in a corner when things get really difficult. So how do we deal with that? Because things will be constantly changing and new things will be appearing all the time. So um, how, how could, to negotiate this with a taxonomy and ontology that is actually effective uh, to deliver value to the construction sector? 
but that's that's a big question <laughs> maybe for the next time yeah my, my answer is always find someone else has already done it because most likely we're, we're the last <laughs> one's the game and you know whether yeah. it's this orange button or or these other you know re registration you know and and really analyzing and studying them and which ones do apply to us and which ones don't i think the last thing we want to do is recreate the wheel right um, because it is going to always change. So it's just how do we yeah. make sure we're referencing whatever is the latest and let them deal with the iterative changes to it. So, you know, building smart handles all the changes in BIM and construction blockchain consortium handles all the blockchain <laughs> and uh, digital twin consortium handles all the digital twin. But obviously there's going to be overlap between the three of those, right? Yeah, lots so, of both. Yeah, so like what is that, I mean, that's what we're having right here. I, I, I can't tell you an answer, but we obviously know, all know we need to do it. <laughs> we can't do it in our own silos. That won't solve the problem. Um, yes, yeah, I think there are other approaches we should, uh, when we think about the digital twin, we can have this kind of a classicistic point of view where we try to organize everything before we put it out there, uh, or we can let things emerge. And that's when uh, machine learning plays a great uh, uh, role in uh, organizing all this. So there's a couple of projects I came across where people do whatever they want with families, with you know, BIM families, Revit families, and so on. And, uh, and then uh, you have the system that say, okay, statistically, this is the family, this is the BIM object you're looking for. Uh, whatever the metadata of that family, well, because of the metadata and how that object is being used, uh, you can use some, uh, some uh, machine learning techniques to organize the mess for you. And then uh, we need to see how we conciliate this with our ontology and something like an IFC ontology and so on. And also when you have massive ontologies like this, you think, oh my God, no, uh, I need a meta description to make this useful. And uh, things get, uh, you need to kind of rationalize that ontology in, in bite sizes so that it's actually useful when you're doing your work. I, th I think you've just volunteered yourself for next month. <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, yes, and. <laughs> Make a note, Nathan. Yeah, oh, it's, it's noted, <laughs> duly noted. Um, so yes, no, that, and those are the types of conversations that, yeah, we, we want to be having.